Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. We just had a little technical, and it was not my fault. It was nobody's Listen, fault. We're going to put it that no, way. I'm not going to call anybody out. <laughs> Listen, but, but shit rolls uphill. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, we have some difficulties. We're, we're all good now. So we're here to talk about group lighting. We've um, started the season in football as big groups. We've uh, done a lot of high school groups, 100 plus, um, and we're doing uh, 50, 60 players tonight, like three groups of them. And group lighting is always a huge challenge, and it kind of makes a big difference of how you, if you really look pro or not. So Glad to have John Scott from Robert's Camera. If you don't know John, he is incredibly knowledgeable. We've had him on before, but um, he's also been to Boatwright Boot Camp, which is a big deal. The explanation why is because he understands what us as volume photographers kind of go through. And, and most camera stores, they just order takers. They don't know what's going on. So having John as a resource is a big deal. So if you haven't met John, call him if you need gear because he's going to steer you the right way. But that being said, introduce a little bit about yourself. Like how long – how have you been doing this, John? Tell me a little bit about your expertise. How long have I been uh, involved in, in photography? I've been involved in photography since 1997. Mm -hmm. um, I started working for my high school photo teacher who ran a portrait studio business. And I was enthralled from like day one of class and, uh, you know, carrying cases, getting coffee, whatever, just to be in the mix. So um, it's... I've, I've been doing this since I was this tall. Um, I started with Roberts in 2004 and, uh, and kind of never looked back. It's, it's always been a, a really good place, good place to work. We're a family business, uh, third generation. You know, we've been in Indianapolis since 1957. And, uh, man, it's cool. Uh, you know, it's, they, they, they say that, you know, you make it a year in at this place and you got a real good chance of becoming a lifer, you know? So, um, Photography's always been a, a passion. It's been a business. Um, I understand it. I work with pros all over the country, and uh, it's it's fun. The best part about this is getting to work with awesome people, uh, both on the on the customer side and on the vendor side. So you know we're we're a nice conduit to to help people get things done, and uh, get to do cool. Whoa. I think I did that last time too. Get to do <laughs> super cool things uh, like uh, like this, you know. Snake right through. There we go. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of conversation about teams. You know, yes. you guys are jumping right into season. You're doing big groups. Um, a, a, a question came up in the uh, boot camp page, you know, like how to light it. You know, like what's what's simple, what's easy, what's going to get the job done, what's going to do it fast. We all know this is putting 20, 40, 80 kids, you know, in, in sequence and getting them posed right and making sure all the eyeballs are on the camera. That takes mm -hmm. so much mental power. So you got to do something that's simple and easy and just lights it very cleanly. Um, so that's, that's what we're going for. That's what we're going to look at today. And I've done kind of like a mock setup. But um, there's a couple things I'd like to talk about as we go through this. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jay, if there's anything you wanted to talk about as far as the way your approach to things uh, you know, kind of preface anything. Why don't you go ahead and, and do that first? And well, Justin, know Grafton, yeah, I want to know about Grafton's group shots. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. mine are horrible. I'm here to learn from you guys. I'm not going to lie. I don't, I'm probably the worst person to ask about group <laughs> shots. I take the least amount of time on those. Um, you know, honest to gosh, I'm, I don't, I don't pack around the GPS risers. I don't do all the stuff it probably takes to make to put the time in to make those images my best images. I, um, and I'm very jealous of everyone else's because they're all so much better than mine. I mean, I can't even sit up here on a podium and be like, I'm so great at it. Can I light anything? Yeah, I can light anything, but my posing on groups is the worst. So I want to learn more about that. Well, I think <laughs> that um, the, the, you know, it was funny cause we get a lot of questions. Like I was only posting, I only, typically only post individual photos in the Facebook groups and people were like really thought I never even took any team shots. And that's as far from the truth as we could possibly be. So um, I do a lot of team photos, but they're not really what sells. I mean, I mean, the people want to see pictures of their kids. They do the team photos important and, it, and it's kind of the thing where you have to do it and it makes you look pro and do it right. That sort of thing. But when I go back in all my orders and look, there's very few now with, 
you know, using photo day, especially where it's just a team photo, you know, most of them are individual orders, but shooting a lot of high school lately is very important to that coach. And you're not going to get all that other business unless you nail the team photo. So it's a requirement, especially as you get to the older kids, I think middle school, high school, it's a requirement that you nail the team photo. I think you have a little bit more latitude on the youth leagues because they're youth athletes. There's going to be there's going to be a couple of kids that are going to misbe- misbehave in that group photo, and everybody kind of accepts it, you know. But if you screw well, up so, high school and they're in uh, programs and they're selling the programs, it's a big deal. Yeah, my my high school stuff goes up on the OSAA state website. That's their team. You know, everybody right. sees that image, so I definitely want to look my best when it comes to a team photo. And I, you know, I try, but I'm they're still not not what I want them to be. Right. I'm thinking about going with a hybrid this year. I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking about doing a little just lasso light for team and then shooting some natural portraits in the, you know, with, with some of the, the tools we have available to us these days. So. We're having quants on tomorrow, John. So I can't wait to tell quants that just is going full composite. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Greek. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't like, I uh, am kind of a, uh, with my uh, team photos, we need to be more systemized than we are. I think, and uh, I think we discussed this, John, that I think a light meter is a really good option, especially for team photos. I don't have to use light re- meter for individual stuff just because I've, I've you know, done it for so long and we kind of have a system to make sure lighting is, is pretty much spot on. But for the team photos, I think it's very beneficial to have that light meter. So hopefully we can talk about that a little bit. Those of you who are just getting started with these big groups, having that as a tool, I think is, a really good idea. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, for big, you know, for baseball teams, it's pretty easy. I mean, you can get away with one light and a big umbrella for not a windy day or somebody hold it and you can have some pretty dramatic, you can get some pretty dramatic lighting on uh, groups of 15 or less. But once you get in those big football teams, having some, knowing some tricks of the trade and knowing a little bit about the inverse square law and how all that works and, and what options you have on reflectors is what I want to know more about. So let's see what you got on that wall back there. Tell us some, what's going on. Brian, I wanted to bring everyone here to highlight our yellow category. Uh, we do a, we, once a year, we do a, uh, an image competition, and people send stuff in from all over the country. So we had Nikon did a sponsorship this year, so we got a yellow category for Nikon. And, uh, and it was just it was first Friday last week. So uh, I got a whole gallery of, of cool pictures from all over people all over the world. Hey, can um, you uh, before you get started on that though? I want you yeah. to also tell people you, you just glossed over it about working with professionals like in like newspapers, NFL, NBA, like professional pro teams. Do can you just tell us a little bit about that? Like so, some of the photographers that you're helping out with gear. Yeah, I mean we we we, we do professional sports. We do you know major news groups, news agencies, um, you know large corporations. So it, there's. It, my my team, which is myself and two salespeople and my shipping guy and our coordinator, which you know keeps us all in line and follows around with a dustpan and brush brush as we're you know racing 100 miles an hour to get things done. Uh, you know we we cover the country and we cover some you know large clients, uh, but we also work with sole proprietorships, right? I mean it's there. What we found in the last 10 to 15 years is really just that. There are so many people that need genuine service, right? Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't, you know, anybody can buy, go online and buy a thing. You can click a mouse button, right? It's, it's super easy to buy something, but how do you qualify that? How do you, how do you know it's the right thing? How do you know it's going to do the right job? And frankly, it's just experience, you know? And then you got people that are like you, Jay and Justin, that are very competent and capable photographers, but you got a job to do. You know, you're you're not making money if you're sitting there researching things. You're up, you want to be out there producing, right? That's that's how you're making your income. So, you know, we we are that asset for all these all these individuals. You know, so yeah, I mean, I got NFL teams and agencies like Getty and you know newspapers all across the country, and it's you know that's I'm not trying to name drop. There's there's some there's some big accounts that we deal with and have for 30 years. You know, and that's that's really important business to us, obviously. Uh, but I don't want you to feel like you know, oh, it's just them. I mean, there's there are so many people that need help, just yeah. genuinely need education and service and how tos. And um, I mean, I got 
I got one guy that's called me four times in the last 20 minutes. I'm watching my phone go. <laughs> Somebody call him back. You know, it's uh, he needs he needs some help. So we're going to give him a call and, and help him out and problem solve some stuff for him. So, awesome. um, you know, that's what we do. This is what we do day in and day out. It's super fun. Well, it's right. I will just iterate, reiterate that. Like, it's nice to... I think we have to kind of do some research as professionals. We have to stay with the times. We can't solely rely on one thing, but it's really nice to be able to, you know, in this day and age, go online, find a review of something, check it out, but then be able to, you know, to call John and go, Hey, you know, I read this yeah. or I saw this. What yep. What's the reality what's about this it? product? Yeah. Are they just selling me on this or, and you know, it's nice to have you in our back pocket, you know, to call and, and bump that stuff off and really get a professional's, you know, opinion about what's going on in the industry, not just something we read or saw online. So, right, yeah, absolutely, awesome. yeah. right. And honestly, the feedback from you guys helps me tremendously. You mm -hmm. know, I don't, I, I'm busy doing this. You're busy doing that. So, yeah. You know, here's the thing that's going to work. Here's what it's designed to do. Here's the, here's the pros and cons because nothing's perfect, right? Here's where it's going to help you. Here's where it's not going to help you. Okay, great. You made a decision. You know, oh, I put it to use. It worked great for my shoot, but here's something that I would like to do a little bit better. Ah, okay, let's have that conversation, right? It's that just constant back and forth and and the information I get back from people that are out there in the world using the stuff helps me inform everybody else, you know? And that's the whole, like, it takes an army kind of concept. Like, you got to just keep pushing. Um, yeah. Hey, friends, speaking of, speaking of professionals, how are you? Um, Oh, uh oh, lost your feet. Did they trip over your camera setup, your friends? <laughs> no, no, stupid. I didn't, I didn't plug an AC power into my camera because I'm lazy. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> all right, so we got a 30 minute before it ticks off again. All good. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's do this. Here yeah. is, and I'm using constant lights today because obviously we're, you know, we're doing a video, right? Let's, let's make this obvious. Um, I'm going to rack in the focus on this thing here. All right. And I just grabbed some stands. So don't feel like, you know, these are the stands you have to use when you're shooting teams. I'm on some C stand kits with grip arms. Um, but basically, what tap I want you to look at tap here. Your, tap your focus button because you're out of focus. It's on you. Must be a cannon. Must be cannon. It is a cannon. Yeah. Ah. Uh, are you too close? Sony would there have figured go. it out. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So um, I don't have – I've been selling these things left and right, those, uh, those focused reflectors, the sports reflectors, Jay. Yes. That, that you just picked up. And I literally I'm, – I'm waiting on more to come back in from Westcott. They're like – they come in, they go right back out. So I don't have those here, but – we can we can describe it. We can show what okay. the benefit of us. This I'll is. Put, I'll put a link to it. Do you have one on your? Uh, I'll just go from Westcott's website. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, it's called a uh, deep focus reflector, forty five degree. Right. Okay. So when we're talking about reflectors, um, I'm going to pop this thing off of here for just a second. This is you know it's a hard dish, right? So a couple of benefits for you guys. Um, obviously, one is that it's small. And it doesn't catch the wind. So, you know, you're doing a lot of your, your big teams, you're doing outside on bleachers or GPS, whatever. Uh, so you want something that's that's gonna be a nice accommodating size that's not gonna be a giant sail. Um, the lighting will be hard. It will be punchy. It's a small modifier, right? It's not gonna diffuse that light. It's not gonna give you a big four foot octa kind of pretty light from six feet away. Your light's gonna be, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 feet away sometimes. And also that distance really helps you out, right? Because light will travel. And the farther it travels to, from point of origin to where you're putting your light, where you're gonna photograph you know, your subject matter, the farther that distance, the more it's gonna carry beyond them. So you don't have that really rapid fall off like you do in a small portrait setting. You know, when I'm this far away and you're gonna take my photograph, that light's gonna be gone. It's gonna go full shadow by the time it gets to my shoulder. But in a large environment, you're going to have nice light travel. You're going to have an evenly illuminated photograph from front row to back row because that distance is helping you out. This is going to focus the light. It's going to punch all of that energy that's coming out of that flash tube in a very specific path. Okay, And that's what that 45 degree measurement is 
on that sports reflector. Um, and the rest got reused because it's just, it's super affordable and it gives you really good efficiency, okay? It's also, and the efficiency is really important, if I were to measure this light without a reflector on there, obviously that light is scattering, right. okay? You put the reflector on there and it's punching that light in a very directional path. You, meet, you measure it again, right? Handheld meter. It's gonna give you a much brighter output because all of those photons, right? All that light coming out is being focused in one particular path. It's pushing very specifically 45 degrees out. The other really nice thing I like about the 45 degree is we all know what 90 degrees is, and we all know that half of 90 is 45. So you don't have to be, you have to try to like get your protractor out and figure out your angles. Like you can look at it and go, well, this is 90 and that's about 45, and I can stand here and kind of go, eh, there it is. That's my light output from X distance away, right? That's super easy to visualize. So right. all we're doing is trying to make things easy on you. All right. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm gonna do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think that's a Fortnite dance. I think that's a dance. <laughs> <of the video. laughs> All right. So, here's what I want to do I'm going to put this thing back. All right. Try to get it roughly even with the other light. Hey, John, your sound is so good now. Can you knock it down one well, couple levels? <laughs> Bring it down a little bit? Yeah, just a little bit. Let me see. Go Is ahead. That Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Is that better? Or go back up. Go up one. Better? Yeah, that was, that's good. Yes. Okay. We can, we can move it. All right. So obviously, I, I went super wide on my lens now because I want you to be able to see the whole room, right? right? I want you to see where that fall off is. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we all have a little different process. Jay, feel free to chime in. Justin, you don't do this, so don't. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I tend to not go directly flat light in. Okay. okay. And the reason being is we're casting a circle of light. Okay. Right. So if I'm aiming, if I'm feathering up a little bit, cause you uh -huh. want to kind of push toward the back row because they're a little farther away and you want the feathered edge light from the bottom of the dish to catch the front row, the most intense beam of light is going to be straight out from the front of the strobe. Right. And right. the edge of that light, we're going to have fall off as it moves to the periphery of the illumination pattern, right? Right. So, actually, I'm going to kill one of these things. Um, hey, uh, we have a question here, John, while we're, yeah. while we're going, while we're setting that up. Um, yeah. Difference between this reflector and a long throw reflector. Is that kind of the same or are they a little bit different? Or is the long throw even narrower than a 45 degree? It depends on the brand. But yeah, commonly we're going to say something in like the 30 to 45 ish range. I'm going to call it a long throw. That's okay. fair. And, so it's and, all the same thing. Okay. We've got some different terminology that's been, you know, marketed by certain brands of, you know, strobe versus another. Um, so Westcott calls it a deep focus, which means okay. literally nothing. <laughs> got it. Got it's just it. a catchy name. So the angle output is really what we want to pay attention to. Um, it is worth noting that the bell curve of that uh, reflector uh -huh. really does matter, right? So diff not all reflectors are made the same. Uh, okay. You know, you can have a seven inch dish and a seven inch dish and a seven inch dish, and that's just the diameter across the front end. And those are commonly used as like umbrella reflectors, similar right. to like on this light here. But the bell of that and the, how the interior of that reflector is treated makes a huge difference as far as the efficiency of how that light comes out the front of it. Huh. And it could be the difference of a stop or so, right? As well, you, as can you explain like it. how it's treated? Like, because I noticed like the, the, the reflector you're using right there, that comes from, um, that's the Nan, Nan light reflector. It's super shiny. It's got the little squares in it. The dimples to, in it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Compared to the, some of the other ones are just like a smooth <laughs> painted white. Yeah. So that's going to be, that is that type of reflector going to be a higher output than just like that one that's a white? Smooth one? Or, yeah, smooth right. one. So this particular reflector for this light was designed for this light. Okay. Okay. It's a paired thing. And what they do is they know that the, the, the supercell of that LED array that's in there, that's illuminating light. They know the size of it. They know how it outputs. They know what the little frosted diffuser is on it. They've done all the math on that when they made this thing. And then they made this with all these little kind of diamond uh, bumps on the inside to help bounce the loud 
ooh, and then it comes out the front, right? So it is a, this is, this is not just a simple piece of metal. This thing is really technically engineered. Right. And you're going to find that as you go through right. different reflectors, some are really made very, very well, and some are not made really well. And when you're buying a reflector for 12 or 20 bucks versus 100 or 500, there's a difference. There really is. And it's about how, the, how efficient that reflector produces light and how it treats that light and how it falls off and how the edge of that light looks. There's all these characteristics, okay? So they're just don't, don't treat one like it's all the same as the other. There are definitely differences in reflectors. Okay, that's interesting. What did you say, Justin? Oh, he. I liked the sounds he made when it was bouncing around. Like that? Oh, yeah. It's the loudest light I've ever heard. Yeah, I um, I always find that interesting because you know there's the the Godox beauty dishes that I bought, you know, and then you know it was a policy buff had the silver and they had the white, and then I got the, that I had that uh, reflector he has there for my Nan light, and that thing looks super cool inside of it, mm. and yeah, I mean, and I got it, and I have the Westcott long. Deep focus. I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> I like Great it. But the, the Godox makes one, but the, but then they're the like you said, the bell is completely different. So I guess if you're gonna be you know real world, I guess you have to have a light meter to see what that is gonna actually do, correct? I mean, How many really, more stops it's giving you? Yeah, yeah. Where it's going. yeah. To, to measure the efficiency differences, that's true. But here's why this little mock setup actually makes a whole lot of sense. Okay. If you've got a nice, big, neutral color, fairly bright painted white wall, right? White, gray, beige, whatever. As long as it's not like, you know, cardinal red, okay? You want that light to bounce off of there. If you look back at the periphery uh -huh. of that light, you know, look at this. Look at that fall off. Yeah. Okay? You can see the characteristics of how a light's going to look, how absolute punchy it is in the middle. Uh -huh. Versus how it starts to fall off to the edge. And I'm not looking at my hand. I'm looking at the shadow. Right. Shadows tell you everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. You'll also notice that that's not a sharp shadow. Mm -hmm. That's what the interior of that reflector is doing. Okay. If I take this thing back off and we do the same thing, totally yeah. different shadow, right? Uh-huh. Okay, it's kind of hard to see. Obviously, we're not zoomed in, but it's a yeah, totally but I mean, it's razor sharp, actually. Like, yeah, I mean, you can definitely tell. Right. It's like, and yeah. if you put this with a grid on there, or a snoot, or something to really funnel that light down, or the the forty five degree or thirty degree is going to punch that light even more. Okay, right. that's going to help you create more and more definition. Keep in mind that when you're looking at what we call, you know, sharp light or or hard light, okay, that's creating contrast. Right, big light source, less contrast. Small light source, big contrast. Everything else being relative, you know, distance and and all the other parameters of you know as far as you know light to your subject. So, more contrast creates more edge detail, which makes things look sharper. Our eyes can pick up light and shadow right next to each other much better than they can if it's soft and spread out. So when you're looking at 100 little tiny faces on an 8x10 or 11x14 print, I want those faces to be sharp. I want to see the details. I want to see the features. I like hard light for that. I don't want to try to do a soft light, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to see all the details. And the punchier your light is, the easier that's going to render on your produced final image. Okay. That make sense? Yeah. Okay. They won't, they won't like not looking as flattering, though. <laughs> if they're flattering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you were talking about like I, I have been feathering my lights up a good bit, like, you know, in that front. So the fr I'm not just blasting, you know, that 45 degree right in the middle on the front row and then getting some fall off towards the back. I've been have been tilting my lights up just a little bit just right. kind of so kind of go over. And that was something that Dave Stott always preached too. you know, when he's done these huge groups of 400 people and just ridiculous size groups where he would set up in a gymnasium and on the catwalk he would just aim his lights all over the top of the band or whatever you see what i'm saying not directly on them so that way the feathered light would catch him and it would be a little bit more pleasing right right and that has a lot to do with how tall those lights are on the stands how right. close they are to the subject you know keep in mind if if you're going to be only 12 feet up on a stand and you're going to aim that light you know let's say parallel to the ground well the, the bottom edge of that light is going to strike the ground way before it gets to your subject. Mm -hmm. So you're putting light a shorter distance 
and that light is reflecting back off and your camera's picking it up. Mm -hmm. Well, that light going the shorter distance is going to be brighter. Right. Right. It has less to travel and less to diminish. So you're going to have that, you know, fluorescent green grass in front of the bleachers before the light gets to the proper yeah. exposure, how you set your camera for yeah. the subject, for the, for the, for the people's skin tone and, and jerseys and whatever else. So that's where, you know, kicking those lights up, you're keeping that you're feathering that light off the ground. You're right. aiming more for the back row. So you got that direct path farther away. Right. And the shorter output from the light is hitting the front row. And what you're doing is trying to create some equilibrium between those two points of light contact. Well, right. it's so important right. for people to understand that and, and play with that when you get a light and you start noticing that. I, I learned that pretty early on. I used to shoot with just beauty dishes because it's kind of all I ever had. It's what I could afford after spending all my right. money on expensive lights. lights. And I yeah, one, pro, one beauty dish. I felt like yeah, the, pro, the pro photo beauty dish was just going to handle everything. And I got pretty good at using it, but you had to always tip it up towards the sky shooting portraits if you're shooting full body because that front would get bright on you, you know, mm -hmm. or – you know, that's where I learned to feather. And and it's amazing how many photographers don't understand the concept of fall off and feathering your light and what that actually does. And and this is a great example of that. So. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna kick on the other light here. So we're gonna okay. wash this wall with an even illumination. Okay? okay. My aim as far as positioning those lights left and right, how you know they're they're equidistant off of my camera line, right? I'm dead in with my camera. So this one probably needs to go. Pretty close. I'm, you know, within a couple inches. Okay. Right. So now I'm, I'm flat lighting this. Okay? okay. Which means not that they're the same light or anything. I'm flat lighting, meaning that they're going to put out the same amount of power from both lights. Okay. okay? They're both set to the same power output. Now these are actually okay. different lights, but I kind of dialed these in earlier. So what we what our, our aim is to bring these up and not go totally flat in because I don't want the bottom edge of my reflectors, right, where that light output is, I don't want that to come in and be like a circle that comes in the bottom middle of the front row of my group. Okay. Okay. So we want to watch, we want to bring those in just a little bit. Okay. So I've got, instead of being totally flat, I'm going to kick them in just a touch. Okay. Uh, okay. Now yeah. that's going to combine light. Okay. When it gets to the center portion, we're going to overlap those a little bit, but with distance, if yeah. I'm, if I'm at the appropriate distance, I'm not going to get too much of a hot spot there. Right. And I'm going to have nice, even coverage across that whole front line, okay, mm -hmm. across that whole middle, and then watch the outside. So what we'll do is we're trying to find that sweet spot as far as how far away from my camera position they need to be and how far angled in they need to be. Okay. You want to be careful that you don't angle in too far. Don't put them way out and bring them too far in because then you're going to get into cross lighting. And cross lighting is going to be too... Um, shadows too acute of an angle yeah. right and you're going to start throwing shadows from people's noses and people's heads and if one guy's like kind of leaning in a little bit and the next dude's kind of leaning back a little bit you're going to get the shadow onto him right okay and you can't keep 80 people in line you can't you right. can't make sure that they're all you know nose across for everybody's perfectly there unless you're shooting military sure because they've right. been trained right we're dealing with with kids so uh, we're going to kick this thing back on Come on. There we go. Okay. So you can see again the periphery. Okay. I'm going to take my meter. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to work one side to the other. Okay. So there we're at F2 and a half, F2 and 9 tenths, F2 and 9 tenths. Okay. So I actually have four tenths of a stop, or sorry, three tenths of a stop over here. So I'm probably angled in just a touch sharp on this side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that wasn't a big change, but I'm catching my edge now. There's two, eight, two, eight and two tenths, two, eight and three tenths, two, eight flat. Okay. okay? So my, my variance of exposure is a third of a stop on today's cameras with so much dynamic range. I'm not going to sweat that whatsoever. Right. right? You're good. You're good. You're in the ballpark. Now, again, I took the time to kind of dial these things in a little bit before we got started, so I knew roughly where we are. Obviously, you can see this one's taller. This one's up higher, okay? Which is why when I measured up the wall a little bit, I got a third, two eight and a third, 
okay? So now we're kind of roughly on the same line. Go back and I can hit that. So when you're doing a group that's, you know, five, six, seven, you know, lines, right? You got to go through there and measure each line, not each line. One right. in the middle, one in the middle, yeah, one, one in the middle of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and as long as your fall off isn't maybe more than a half a stop, so, you mm -hmm. know, two thirds of a stop, you're in the neighborhood, right? You're, you're okay. That's a shot. Nothing's going to be totally perfect, but that's your shot. And you're going to get good, even tone across that whole thing, left to right, top to bottom, front to back, and you're good. And you don't have to fuss with it anymore. Again, this is supposed to be fast. This is supposed to be easy. Okay, mm -hmm. but having just the right couple of reflectors, small stuff, punchy light, sharp shadows, you know, good illumination across everybody, the right angle, the right distance, the right you know, distance away from your camera position, the right distance away from your subject. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of things, but once you get that stuff to, start to dial it in, just like with your individuals, you don't have to go back and meter this stuff necessarily every time because it's right. going to start becoming repeatable process and it's going to be in your head. Yeah, the only big challenge that I feel like we have, and I don't do a lot of high schools. I maybe have like five high schools programs that we shoot, um, but there's a huge difference in the stadiums. Like some stadiums, you can get the lights right on the kids. Some stadiums, like you know, I did the one that I posted, you know, that Cass High School, that big one with 100 plus kids. I mean, we were really far away from the kids because um, the bleachers were gigantic. So that is a lot very variable what you can do. Like, I mean, that one where we, um, that big shot, if they had, the stands were so big, they had like, you know, little tunnels in the middle of the stands to come up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so we, we boomed lights out that way. But if they didn't have those, there'd be absolutely zero point to have lights because they were, we were just so far back, if that makes sense. Like, I don't really know if you had, if you had to really blast some light, what are you going to do? What you're going to use a long, long throw 1200 watt lights and as many as you can get or what would you what would you say a big 100 plus football shot yeah the the, the bigger problem that you're going to see probably with that is unless you've got some monster light stands that can get 15 right. 18 feet yeah yeah you're going to be up lighting people because you got you got 100 kids you're going to do five or six rows right <laughs> you don't want them yeah, super, super wide they're going to have to go up. And you have to do every other row. So you're really looking at, like, if you had 10, 11 rows, you're looking at, gosh, yeah, you're looking at yeah. 20 rows. 20 right. rows. You don't, and you want, you know, worst case scenario is you uplight maybe the top row, just a touch, right. just like an angle, just like a degree of an angle, okay? Not drastically, which means you're probably, let's say you skip the first, what, three, four rows, okay? So that's taking you up to maybe about five feet off the, off the deck. Okay, and then you're going to go five more rows, so that's going to be maybe a foot, 14 inches or so per row. So let's just say it's a foot, so it's easy, right? For every row, you're adding two feet. Okay, Sounds so like a composite foot, job. Seven foot to nine foot to 11 foot to 12 foot, you got a six foot tall kid. They're on you know, top of their head is going to be 18, 19 feet off the deck. Yeah. So unless your stand really gets up there, you're going to have to uplight them, which means yeah. you're throwing light. I mean, it, it looks weird. You start to get a little bit of that ghoulish. Now, yeah. the icing for you guys is that you're probably not, you're not overpowering daylight in that scenario. No. So even if you uplight them a little bit, you're throwing a little bit of brightness in the eye. You're pulling some of the shadow out of the, under the chin, yeah. out, under the brow. You're just, it's just lifting it a little bit. You can be two to two and a half stops under ambient and, you're, and your lights are doing the job. Okay. okay. But again, you, you got to be far away. Because now yes. you got to worry about inverse square law. You got to worry about that light falling off. Yeah. Okay. From where front row to back row. So that that kind of thing don't it's it can be really tricky. It can be, and yeah. it does require a lot of power. So yeah, if you got two twelve hundreds and two high performance reflectors, I probably wouldn't throw an extra one light in there. I, you know, if you had four or four six hundreds, you know, if you just don't have you don't have the extra lights, your <laughs> four six hundred is going to give you you know what obviously the combined power of two 1200s, but four 600s can maybe more equally distribute that light across a big team. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, I think a, light, a light low and a light high. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a good idea too. Cause the thing is the 1200 with, with the Godox, which most of us use anyways, they have the extension cord that's six feet. So you can't even raise that thing, you know, so it has to be a 600 that right. Justin, are you, is there anything? Yeah. The 1200 cord is way short. 
way short. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to get that up on even the short cambo sometimes. Like, I almost don't have enough length. I don't think I'm too scared of any team about the lighting situation with uh, middle school teams where we're going to use the GPS risers because then I, then I using the GPS risers um, allows you to get your lights as close as you want to, right? Um, so that's a really big advantage of those. But when you're constrained to the stands, <coughs> I, it's kind of the thing where you have to do it in the morning or the evening. I mean, you I know, have, it's going to be really hard to get it in midday. I, yeah. I have I have four teams that are 100-plus teams that I just sit on benches and use the daylight and add a little fill with my 600s. I mean, You're that's doing, all I've ever ble- done. The bleachers, right? I use the bleachers, yeah. Right. Uh, do you guys have? Do, do you guys buy any of the head extension cables for the 1200? You don't have any? I have it bought them. I have it. Okay. How, yeah, how so, much can that add to it? I don't remember how long they are. That's what I was trying to look up. I think they're, I don't know, maybe like another 10 or 15 feet probably. Oh, that'd be good. Um, right. So that, that helps you out a lot. But keep in mind, anytime you're adding, this is why I want to talk about this. If you're adding linear feet to that power cable, it is a mm-hmm. power cable. And it has impedance like any yeah. cable does. Okay. So you will have some power loss. And I don't know if Godox rates it. Frankly, I'd be surprised if they told you because that's the kind of company they are. Um, but we'll go from, you know, when we would run arena packs into like NBA arenas, you had to measure that, that power loss from, from pack position to the heads. Uh, okay, from where, where all this stuff can be strategically located. If maybe they didn't have a catwalk they could work off of or whatever, you had to have those kind of uh you know reductions of power output so you know x number of linear feet so like maybe 30 feet you do you get that like 30 foot extension line you might lose a stop of light no kidding yeah that's so yeah those old and stuff. yeah and then okay. you gotta worry about the connection too how good is that connection right i mean not even the it's solid because it's, it's the same yeah. it's the same connector the 1200 uses with the same kind of little safety latch so where, where okay. it goes onto the power pack, it's exactly, it's just a male-female fit, right? So it's, it. it actually is pretty good on that. And you're going to find that for most pack, most strobe brands that make packs and then make those head extension cables, they're, they're a pretty solid connection. They know it's <laughs> got to be really good. And worst case scenario, you know, you take it, you mate it, and then you wrap it with some gaff just to make oh, sure, yeah. nothing, you know, it doesn't get a pull and, and short anything. Uh, but again, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you, you want to add that extension, be weary of that. Cause you can probably daisy chain two or three of those things in a row, but you're going to lose at least a stop, maybe two stops of light. So is it, you might as well use the 600. Right. <laughs> right. So Brad's comment is hang it from the light. Say, I want to, I have no doubt Brad has done this. So I'd like to see his setup. Like how are you going to hang that $1,200 pack? on yeah. the stand no no yeah. there's there's good brackets i mean the handle on the top of that 1200 is really solid it so is, you can get yeah. a, a stand bracket you know super clamp whatever with an extension arm that everything locks in nice and tight there's <clears> there's <throat> good ways to do that that's absolutely true uh, huh. but you know keep in mind also obviously where brad lives you know it's a little windy. windy it's windy, <laughs> it's windy where he a lives. little yeah. windy um, i like that idea though like do the um just hang the pack from the stand, like, it, yeah. would you say, what would you need? Um, I would just do a, uh, probably a super clamp and then a snap in pin. It's called a snap in pin. You guys are getting real fancy with it. It's called right? rope. It's called <laughs> rope. Look, not everybody is like lives on the coast and knows how to tie knots and rig. Well, listen, you could tie two stuff. granny knots. It wouldn't matter if you're hanging fifteen hundred dollars worth of equipment off a little bean pole. Then more power to you, anyway. But yeah, I'm not going to add yeah. more. Weight and to and no, that, that's not Brad. You said that. That's a good. That's an extremely important point. That I mean, not- how much is the extension cord? Twenty five bucks. I'm doing that over adding a bunch of MacGyver stuff if they have one. Oh, you mean just a regular power extension cord to, to get to the power to get to the pack? No, the the head extension. That you're oh, no, they're like a hundred something. I mean, still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You spend right. hundred bucks in clamps. So, if we're doing a smaller team, we got a um. We we have a smaller team. Uh, let's just say forty kids. Um, what do you? If you're at midday, and there's no, you can't shade that team photo. So you're going to go with two 1200s with the 45-degree reflector 
we're going to aim it in, aim it in, and aim it up. Not right? in. You're crossing yeah. the light then. Not yeah, too much. Right, a not, little bit. You know, yeah, just a little bit. And, yeah, and <clears throat> the other thing you can do, okay, if you've got a small enough team, let's say maybe 20 kids. So you got, what, th three rows of six, three rows of nine, seven, right, plus coaches, okay. you know, that kind of thing. You, you could probably do that in a short enough distance, and it's going to look a little flashy, right? It's going to look like it's lit rather than being more ambient. Right. But a 1200 has enough kick with one efficiency, one, you know, uh, one sports reflector on it. You could probably throw one of those things up a couple of feet behind you on a tall enough stand and just one light it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, because the, the the efficiency of that reflector is that it's probably adding a stop of light. So in you know in practical nature, you're dealing with a 2400 watt output, you know, comparatively, right? So you're getting an extra stop of light. Okay. So it depends on how much you have to stop down. Depends on how where you want to put your ISO. It depends on what the you know if it's a little bit overcast or full you know direct sun. Um, you know if you can position it where the sun's a little bit. You know if it's past noon and you've got you can have everybody face east, right? right. What if you're lucky, right? You get a little bit of separation out of the sun, and now you got some, you know, some separation for setting things off the background. You could you could start to work kind of the same lighting scheme as what you're doing with your individual. I'm, I'm going to use that for my setup this weekend, not cool. for a team photo, for a portrait session I have on a drag strip. Right. I'm going to go the 1200, the long throw on a stand straight up behind me, right? Because I don't and, have a lot and, of time to set up. That's really important. The position of that stand and that light really almost directly you. Because if you start yeah. pushing it one side, left or right, then you're going to start, you know, throwing that shot to the other side, and you got to be weary of that. Okay, so just be more conscientious. What you're doing is just flat lighting on axis, meaning it's that the light coming from the same position as your lens is seeing. Yeah. So this uh, is yeah. typ this is typically what we do right here, right? So right. I don't know, one, two, three, four, five. So we, we can use the GPS risers. We don't have to use the stands in the back. Um, so yeah, this course number two sitting here with his hands not right. <laughs> that's trying to be crazy. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, it's like we were talking earlier. But yeah, that's super. But we were lucky this day because it was very flat. Um, it was it was overcast, so we got lucky, um, and we were able to just do a couple couple of flashes, tilt them up. And it was simple as that, just getting the expo nail and the exposure. Right. That's, yeah. that's nicely lit. I mean, that's it looks like it's lit, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it's, clean. yeah it's clean. clean. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And you got rich shadows. I mean, that's the thing. Keep in mind, you want shadow, right? You want mm -hmm. shadow sets depth. If you don't have shadow, you don't have depth. You know, you mm -hmm. and you're and you're flat lighting this, so you want a little bit of punchier light because it's going to create a little bit of depth to everybody's individual feature. Okay. Otherwise it's just going to look like a really boring, literally like two dimensional, right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You want some shadow. So that's, that's nice. And, and the fact that it was overcast didn't hurt you at all. No, that was really <laughs> fortunate. That it was overcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, um, you know, we did have, um, uh, it just kind of depends on the situation, but if we can, usually the, the, the team photo, like the big high school, they want to, um, they want to do it, um, in the morning or the evening anyways. So it's usually not too big of a battle. Like, you know, with rec leagues, yeah, you, you know, you have four or 500 kids, you're a little bit, there's nothing you can do, you know, cause you're going to be shooting throughout the day. But the, um, the smaller, small or the big high school teams usually can do something in the morning. So you can use some of the techniques we're talking about. There you go. Sport reflector or the long throw reflector? Yeah, that's a good question. Tell us the difference it's, between those two. Again, we're back to the you know brand X, brand Y naming scheme to some okay. extent. <clears throat> a sports reflector kind of in general, I'm going to put somewhere around like a 40 to 55, maybe a 60 degree output, mm -hmm. where a long throw is going to be a little more acute angle. So more in that like 30 to 50 range. You'll have some overlap between the two. And different brands will call them different things, uh, but you know the, the important thing when you're looking at these things, don't just look at what that particular brand decided to call it. Don't right. look at sports or long throw. Dig into the technical details, dig into the specifications, and see what the angle output is. Okay. And if a company doesn't tell you what the angle output is, boy, I just I steer clear. 
You know, okay. it's just like if they're not going to go so far as to give you some of the metrics of that thing, <clears> it's just, you know, they don't deserve your business. <laughs> right. Yeah, understood. <laughs> you got to know these things. That's all there is to it. Uh, you know, so it's it's important to know those angle outputs because you got to know how that light is going to come off your, you know, and and be represented. You got to be able to to know that going into it and to know how you got to set up. Well, I don't think that the Westcott, um, you know, they're the forty five degree. Uh, long throw there, there or whatever. What's it called? The deep, deep focus. focus. Deep focus. <laughs> I call them long throws. So I mean, you know, the deep focus. It's yeah. Started. yeah, the deep focus. That um, it's not very expensive, right? No, and it's reflective. No, no, no. Right. It's 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 ninety bucks, and it comes with a set of grids. Okay. How cool is that? All right. I actually really like that. I've got an old, actual made by Bowens back when I used to shoot Bowens lighting. Uh, I had an old, um, and it was called a, um, it's like the Pro Photo Magnum. I'm blanking, or the high performance reflector, they call it. Okay. A high performance. Right. But it's that same thing. It's, it's dappled interior, soft <clears throat> silver, and, and 50 degree out, right? And I would use that for like, like Hollywood, like 1930s Hollywood-esque portrait lighting. Because back then that wasn't strobe; that was all hot lights. That was that was film lights and set lights and you know Fresnels and things like. I mean, that was the style and the look because it all came from, you know, from from film lighting where they would right. use on movie sets, right? That was the lights that they used and started using and started scaling down to be more, you know, accommodating in smaller portrait studios. Um, so it was all hard light, right? And then they started just going, "Hey, what if we hang a sheet in front of it?" And yeah. that's where you started getting, you know, twenty by thirty silks. And that's how, you know, that's, that's movie sets. So, mm -hmm. you know, it all kind of trickled down from there, but um, yeah, those, those, those high perform high performance sports, long throw. <laughs> deep focus, yeah, it's all the same you know, thing. Pretty much, you know, look okay. for, look for the actual angle output. That's the thing. Okay. So you're looking at the angle output and what about the actual interior of it? Like, um, is it, do you just have to get it? Cause I know some of them are, are like that reflector you have there is completely different than the one I have from West. Right. So right. are we looking for anything in particular inside of the reflector? Well, keep in mind that when they made that reflector, again, this is really specifically engineered for, for this light, for so the series yeah. of lights from Manlight. And Westcott did the same thing to, to pair up to their FJ400s. So the position of the flash tube inside of that reflector is right. everything. Okay, that really matters. So Godox doesn't necessarily put their flash tube always, even from a 400 to a 600 to a 1200, it's a different flash tube for, yeah. for those three lights, for one, right? Yes. Uh, depending on which 600 you have. And right. the distance it is inside of that reflector changes. That's all variable. So you're going to have some variability as you put the same reflector on different lights. That's just, that's life, okay? You got to kind of do a little bit of your own testing to figure out where things, where things happen. But I will tell you this, and this is a cool story. Um, people who have been around a long time know the lighting brand Dynalite which is yeah. now a defunct lighting brand, okay? Uh, but uh, the guy that ran it for years and years, Peter Paremba, really, really awesome guy, and an engineer. He designed all these things, owned the company, ran the sales division. He's freaking brilliant, right? He, but he's, he's an engineer by, by mind, and he's, he's tooling around with a couple of different things. And honest to God, true story. He, he's messing with his sports reflector that they use for their arena strobes, and he's in there tooling around with it, literally... He moves it, I think it was like a 16th of an inch, either forward or backward, I forget which. But again, that changed where that flash tube emits and hits the bell of the reflector. By moving it, that really, really small measurement, he got like two thirds of a stop more light out of it. Ooh. Right? That's crazy. That's yeah. huge. To get almost twice as much light. And again, that's, that's so critical, the position of all these things, how they line up. So. For you and I, you know, we're not going to go in there and measure everything to the nth degree because right. we got other things to do, right? But yeah, to be fair, some reflectors are going to work better than others. That's true. And all of that has to do with all the position of all the different things, how they line up. Um, the important thing is that you don't go by, if you're going to try to flat light and do these big team shots, you know, match your lights. You know, put two 1200s out. Put two of the same 600s out. Use the same reflector on both sides, literally brand and model number, okay? Because those things are, then you're, you're, you're eliminating those variables. If I've got, you know, brand A light over here and brand B light over here, and this is a 400 and this is a 600, and then I got, you know, two different reflectors made by two different companies, 
good luck. You're right. going to be all over the place, right? So eliminate yeah. those problems, eliminate those headaches. Just consistency is going to make your life easy. Light meters. Since you're saying all this, all, all these little experiments you can do, a light meter would answer a lot of these questions. What yeah. would you do? You have yeah. a favorite uh, brand model since most of us here are going to be <laughs> using it? There's one choice. It's it's only psychonic. Yeah. Right? yeah. It, it just is. I mean, this is literally this is an old Minolta yeah. Auto Meter 4F that's still in my <laughs> rental apartment and still works great. Okay. It, great. it does. And it works, it works fine. Uh, but you know, these things went away in 2006 when Minolta died. Okay. Um, Sakonic is, is where it's at. You don't need a really fancy light meter. You can get a base level, what, 308X, okay. right? That's 308X. Yeah, uh, 100 and 200 bucks, maybe something like that. I forget. Uh, right. But that, you know, all you're doing is, is a basic incident measure, not reflective. That's what your camera is doing. Okay. Incident measurement is I'm measuring the light, not right. the light bouncing off of something going back to a camera. I want to measure the light. Okay. And all I'm going to do is just, again, go through and just make sure that I'm even across the front of a group. If you want to measure how this light performs, it's quite the rig he's got going on there. I say a lot of twisty knobs. Yeah, you like twisty knobs. All right, I heard somebody told me. <laughs> okay, what that mean, stupid John? face. What's that mean? Your face. <laughs> Like yes, no, why do I have business now? I gotta say, no, yeah. I like twisty knobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That was right. You didn't even know what to so, do. I wanted to keep the light kind of out to one side so oh, you can see what it's doing on the wall, right? Yeah. Look, uh, I mean, obviously, it's very punchy in the middle. Yeah. Okay, and my camera exposure is a little off now. Obviously, uh, here, let me do and dial that back. Kind of like your audio. You knock it off. <laughs> well, oh, wait. I mean, you attacked. The other right? I got attacked. So yeah. the bear. He's coming out. Was it well, there? <laughs> okay. There we go. So again, come in. I'm gonna go dead center. Okay. Yeah. I'm f8. I go a foot away. I lost almost a full stop, okay? Now I'm F4, I just lost another stop, mm -hmm. right? So again, this is the drastic experience of how much closer distance, how fast things fall off. Yeah, every foot right? you're losing a stop, right? Like yeah. just within, within 10 inches, Yeah. okay? So dead center, it's gonna be five, six and eight tenths. Here are five, six and three tenths, we lost a half a stop. Here I'm at F4, uh -huh. okay? One stop out. So again, we're, you know, we're, we're making things micro to really make it a very obvious thing, okay? Right. To make it a, a drastic experience. But it's the same math either way, right? It's all about distance. It's all about the beam, beam spread, where that light goes. Mm -hmm. Does that drive? Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, so just so people know, so you, you burn it in, like if you pull that light back, that fall off isn't as drastic, right? So right. that's that inverse square law that everybody always doesn't, you know, they seem to forget about sometimes, but yeah. yes, you pull it back, evens all that light out. It doesn't fall off as fast. Mm -hmm. Right. Bingo. Interesting. All right. I, um, I've got a quick question. It's kind of, <laughs> I guess it's a little bit on top, but I'll, if you want it to, let's say like last night I was shooting in a, a basket, a, a new um, arena for this high school. So they had really bright led lights. Right. But still it's going to cast a little bit, it was a little bit of a yellow. I mean, it didn't match up. That LED still doesn't match up with, you know, if I'm Kelvin 5500, it was still yellow back there, right? Right. So I couldn't really use any ambient for the back because it just looked yellow, kind of crappy. So if I wanted to have a bright background with the, you know, where I don't have that yellow cast, um, I'm going to have to – do you have to go so far as have a, a, a meter that measures color or you would you just gel the light to try to get that light? your white balance right in camera by gelling your light. Your eyes are going to do a terrible job of, of visualizing the, the difference color of color 
in the way that your camera does. You're not gonna, you can't, you can, you can do an okay job of understanding that this is brighter and this is darker. Obviously the, the dynamic range, the tonal value of that sensor is a lot more compressed than what your eye can pick up. But you can say this is brighter and this is darker. We're not, most of us are not gonna be able to pick up the nuance of 400 degrees Kelvin with a 250 degree magenta shift. Right. We're, we're not doing that, right? That's not right. happening. So yeah, a color meter, is is the tool that's what's going to help you actually know and moreover those meters today will also tell you they have logged into their little computer memory banks if you want to compensate to get it back to you know daylight balance 5600k whatever with no tint shift to it it'll tell you which lee filter which roscoe filter whatever that you need to apply onto your strobe that's, that's putting out X you know, daylight balance. So you know exactly which one to dial in. Hmm. That's how fancy those meters are. And that's part of why they're you know, $1,300, right? right. These, are, these are really expensive tools because they're with such incredible precision. There's so much power to it. The other really cool thing they do is you can measure the light and it'll tell you all the different wavelengths of light. It'll tell you what color group is represented in that total output of light. And this is how we, we started realizing when LEDs, constant lights, started becoming much more popular and there was really expensive Aries and there was really inexpensive brand X, right? Yes. Generic brand you never heard of. It was suddenly just appeared one day and it's $37 for a, right. <laughs> you know, how are they doing this, right? You start putting it on a color meter and you start realizing that their, their rendering index, the amount of color that they actually put out in all those different zones of color, red, green, blue, you know, brown tones, mustard yellows, whatever, right? It's, it'll show you where it's represented and where it isn't. And what we found is that almost all of them were terrible in red channel. So if you're shooting skins, skin tone, right, pigment, you're done. Those lights just don't push color out that can then be reflected and recorded by a good camera sensor. They're not putting out that spectrum of light. It's not full spectrum. So you're getting a really dismal reproduction because the LED isn't producing the whole spectrum of color that needs to bounce off of that skin tone and come back to the camera. So right. that's where LEDs have become a lot, lot better with today's, today's gear is significantly higher end color rendering index and TLCIs. They're getting you actually good reproducible color that's, that's full gamut. That's really important. Um, to answer your question, you could absolutely do it the right way, then use a color meter and have a full set of all the gels you're going to put on your light, or you could just wing it and try to get close, okay? Right. It, and, and it's really tough in those kind of environments that have weird kind of yellow greenish shifts because you don't know how far it shifts. So if you wanted to go in there and take like, a minus green quarter cut and and put a an eighth you know ctb on it right so a minus green is going to be a kind of a, a magenta color gel so it's going to take green out by adding magenta and a ctb color temperature blue is going to add blue but and take some warmth away right and you're gonna have to layer all those things up to kind of figure out what's the right package of gels to balance out that color shift also, keep in mind, those gels are reducing light output because they right. have density. Yeah. A right? lot. So how much light are you going to lose? Exactly. You can play that guessing game all day long with you know, the 400 different sheets of gel that you own in your package, which nobody does. Right. You know? and, and maybe get it. Maybe. You might get close enough. You know? But it's, it's just a horrible guessing game. We're not tuned for color. Okay? Use, use this. That save you, save your butt. If you're really, if you're working in those situations a lot, yeah. that's a really worthwhile investment to get that color meter. But how? Okay, this is my question. So, if I got good at it and I was doing color meter, gelling up the lights. Let's go. There's two. Let's just say two lights, and that way we're having the background where I can show the gym where it's a brand new gym and they want to see all the logos and all that stuff, right? If you're really proficient at it, how long does it take to get the your lights colored? are gelled correctly if you've got the, if you got the meter yes 
before you set up any of the lights, you're going to go in there and you're going to meter a couple of different spots because I guarantee you that they've got GE bulbs over on this side and Sylvania bulbs over on this side. Okay. Right? And they're going to be different. Same as when they were sodium vapor in the gym. They were even more drastically different. But, Orange, you know, pink, and, and these, <laughs> you're going to have some changes. Okay? And keep in mind that those aren't photographic lights. Those are task lights. Right? They're, right. they're, they're, they're pretty good, but right. they may not be great. So right. you might still have some dismal color output from it, okay? So start there. So go around, meter it in a couple of different places. That should take you all of about three minutes, okay? Figure that out. And most of them will have a memory recall where you can kind of figure out where it was. So you can go back through and, and even average things, okay? Get to an average or, or localize where you're going to shoot, where that light's going to look on that side. Once you figure out what that color is, then you can start to do the math for your gels. Okay, and the math is pretty easy. If we're talking about a full cut CTO, color temperature orange, which takes us from daylight to tungsten, that takes us from 54, 5500 to 3400 degrees. It's a 2000 degrees degree color shift. So if we have a half cut, that's a thousand degrees. If it's a quarter cut, that's a 500 degree. If it's an eighth cut, that's a 250 degree. It's all Kelvin, right? These are measurable units. It's just Kelvin, no big deal. You're adding, you're subtracting, okay? okay? So once you got that, and then you know what your, your magenta shift is to, you know, to add the, you know, the my screen. Yeah, you, you go through your gel collection. You go, okay, I need an eighth cut of this and a half cut of this, and it's a 12 by 12 sheet. I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to gaff tape it, loop the room, let the thing breathe, and, and you're done. If it's a small reflector like that, great. If you're trying to do it inside of a softbox, it's harder. You need a bigger sheet. you got to get inside the box. you got to tape it up to the inside of the box you know, a couple of corners, whatever, make again, make sure it's not right there because you don't want to burn anything. Okay. I mean, if you're good at this and you, and you do this regularly within 10 or 15 minutes, you're going to have everything dialed in. Okay. But yeah, exactly. It, this, this is, this is complicated. That's why everyone just goes kill the gym lights. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah just, right? just like yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, we just blast everybody with light and just make right. it dark. Or you do the cool background, or yeah. you light for effect. Okay. Yeah. So here's the other, here's the other easy answer. Light the background. Okay. Take two more strobes yeah. and wash the background with one of the school colors. Yep. Yeah. Make it an effect. You know, it's okay. You've got creative yeah. license. Yeah, I mean, that, that's typically what I do. I was just kind of curious the other end of the spectrum. <clears> like, because, I mean, that it is the harder thing, but usually we like to do the harder thing to make it look a little bit original. But it, it, that's a lot. I mean, yesterday, you, you, I mean, most of the time you have like, okay, they're done with practice at 6. We're going to start shooting at 6.15. And you have to set up all your lights for team and individual. So, it's, you know, we don't have a lot of time for that. So, um that's the case. So Joey's asking, um, Joey shows without affecting the use of the <clears throat> modifiers. I'm not quite sure, like, um, without affecting oh, the use. <laughs> maybe he's talking about, um, like, well, if you'd throw in a blue gel on there, it's going to knock down your, your power output by a stop. I'm assuming that's kind of what he's Well, as soon about. as you put a flat piece of anything on the front of your reflector, that degree is not what it was coming out of it anymore, right? It changes mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you're gonna, gonna have some. You're gonna have some more bleed. Yeah, that's yeah. that's fair. It'll it'll kick out a little bit. Um, if you're if you're close enough to the front of this thing, oh, you know, maybe maybe he says without taping. Oh. Like, what is a good way to um, bubble gum? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I know uh, there's, there's some. There's, yeah, there's, get, I mean, get gaff. Just get gaff tape. It's easy. Don't fuss with it. Don't try to gaff over it. Every don't over engineer it. Right, buy expensive yeah. tape that doesn't ruin your stuff. Done. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's it's it's. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to dumb it down, but don't make it too complicated. That yeah. really is just simply the be, the best way to do it. If you got you know barn doors or whatever, yeah, you know C47s. You could you could you could clip them around the outside of that binder clips. Whatever works. Uh, whatever you do, don't try to gel the entire front baffle of your four foot octa. Like, bring it in closer to the light. Just make sure there's breathing room. Make sure it's far yeah. enough away from the strobe, uh, from the flash tube. Um, so and you shouldn't have a lot of heat issues off of those, but just give it some room to breathe. Got it. All right, we're over an hour. Stop it. All right, thank you so much, John, as usual. Hey, that was a lot of you. info. Let's rewatch it.
This is proof that the more you do this, the harder it gets to take. A I know it's complicated. Photo. I mean, it's complicated. it gets complicated. Yeah, it does. You know, keep it simple. Seriously, yeah. do, do whatever you can to keep it easy. And and the biggest thing is practice. Yeah. You know, just just do this stuff over and over and over, day in and day out. Don't expect to go out there on day one and be wildly successful. It doesn't happen, right? When you first get a new camera, take pictures of the house plants and the cats and the dogs before you go use it on a job. Get to know your gear. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Ellen Chrome. Yeah, they have a little system. I know that um, Godox does have some little things that you can put around the um, the flash tubes on six hundred pros, but they kind of yeah. melt it. They kind of melt it to it. Not, I don't not like my melt favorite it. thing in the world. Pain to fit. Yeah. Yeah, oh. not my not my favorite thing in the world. I, I go to a gel sheet and just again, you know, give it some space. You can put a twelve by twelve sheet far enough away inside of the box, you know, inside of the soft box that it'll do yeah. mostly do the job. And again, you don't have to get every last scrap of light, right? Most that light, it's gonna bounce around inside of that modifier before it goes out the front baffle. You're gonna color that light. Not an issue. Okay. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Uh, when you're doing a bare light like this, a 12, 12 inch sheet is gonna cover this, no problem. Correct. Yeah, uh, the smaller the, the modifier, the easier it is, right? They have all kinds of yeah, stuff, oh, yeah. little speed yeah. lights for the two. Math is hard and all that stuff. Yeah, math. Yeah. Paul's a math teacher; he can help. Just anybody talk. Yeah. Call Matt, Paul. Paul, yeah. do you have any any issues with your math? Yeah, I mean that could uh, 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 begin. Uh, Cambo stand at the center above. Yeah, I mean you can Absolutely. do anything. You, you can do anything you want. You got to get that Cambo stand up there high. And you have to feather the light, right? I mean, you can't. I wouldn't think that you want to point it straight at somebody. You want to feather it a little bit so that way you're not, you know, just nailing the center of that um, group photo. But yeah, I'm sure that that would be fine for Phil. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And the other cool thing about Pando, obviously, this is so important. Once you get that that height or that position of the light dialed in, that's what the Cambo does. Is it aims it at the same place regardless of the you know the height right. adjustment of the stand. So if you're doing all you're going to do for the next three hours is shoot teams of various sizes and, and group numbers. And that size of that group is going to change. Yeah. That's that camera's actually a really powerful tool for you because all you have yeah. to do is come back and go, oh, I need it to be three feet lower. Done. Let's go. You know, we're back in business. You might have to nudge your power around a little bit for that, that change in, in height. And maybe it changes a little bit in distance, but it's not drastic enough that I would really fuss with it. But so, kids, yeah, in, kids be, also in Florida though, that'd be kind of tough to do outside i think it would be indoor shoot but if you had, had to have a really calm day because the wind does blow that cambo oh right yeah, yeah well okay and keep this a lot of people don't realize this i just talked to a couple people at boot camp on the cambo yeah. it it sits on the baby pen right yeah the outside of that stand adapter is a junior pin so if you've got a combo stance with a junior receiver take the little tightening knob out of out of the cambo adapter and drop it into the junior and oh put down God. on that. It'll fit way in strong. I didn't even know that. I I have another stand it could fit on that would right. work brilliantly Explain. for that. that wait, wait. Oh my God. <laughs> Explain that one more time. Okay. So go to your cambo. Yeah. The little tightening knob. But you put it on top of the pan on the take stand. The the knob, take that knob all the way out. <laughs> now take the whole cambo and drop it into the junior receiver on your combo oh. stand. Oh. Yeah. The it's, outside it, diameter of that stand adapter is one and one eighth it is, is it hefty adapter. enough it's not like if you go to tighten that it's not gonna it's not gonna mess that pin up because it's not it's hollow it's not so well, it, it will on yours because you're freakishly strong but other, <laughs> everybody else is fine <laughs> cj i'm way stronger than you <laughs> <laughs> even john knows. he doesn't lie about nothing i think i can't can like that all right thanks so much we appreciate you <laughs> I'm just yeah, pissed I, I didn't know about that sooner, Shuck. I know. <sighs> All right, guys. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the opportunity, Jay. All right, bud. We'll talk soon. Later. Thanks, Justin. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye.